We're going to join Gavin Comiskey in Qatar. Gavin, good morning to you. How are you? All right, Jer. How's it going? Um, that was ridiculous, really, the level of uh, what we saw at the weekend. We were, we've been talking the whole way through, like you want some shocks, but you don't want too many shocks because weak teams end up getting there. But Morocco aren't a weak team. They're here totally on merit. No, no, no. Uh, I've covered all their games. I've gone very, uh, I've gone a bit North African throughout my uh, World Cup experience. And uh, before the tournament, I spoke to Kil- Kev Kilban, I think about this in one of the early columns he did as well. If you break it down, they've got like two or three before the tournament now, they had two or three Champions League quality players and the rest were high level. I think there's only two or three in in the starting 11 that play football in Morocco. Sorry, Bono plays in Saudi Arabia. Um, but if you go through the team, that you no, know, he's Sevilla actually. Sorry, but the, there was a high level, the Liga, Premier League, some really good players, and like it was always on for them. And then they have in their coach, well, he uh, is just he's just another level of tactical news. He said a very clever thing. He was basically like, I've been this good a coach for ten years, but nobody in Europe will hire an Arab. And so he he got his spoke in on that one, and he, he he's right to be honest. Um, it's not a surprise if you've been watching them and I actually have been watching them for a couple of months um, and if you look like Amrabat uh, though has probably been the revelation of the tournament either him or Unani they've just they, like they've just taken apart every midfield and they like what they did to Spain how they held on how they picked them apart and dominated De Bruyne and Belgium like they really did so yeah it's a shock if you're coming in late to them but um, if you've been keeping an eye on them even before and uh, while he came in as the coach in August, they were they'd gone they'd won twenty of twenty six matches under the Bosnian manager before that, and that was without Z- Zidic coming back. And he's come back and he's been a revelation. He's like uh, a brilliant kind of showman player who also slips into the system and is an auxiliary right back. So um, it's the, the Arab world now for, firmly believes, and the African world firmly believes they can win the entire World Cup. Like it's it's becoming. It's not just a whisper anymore. It's really becoming something special. And presumably you're hearing this manifest itself in the stadium and around. There's been, you know, we, we, we'll obviously talk about everything else and, and the, the rest, the corruption that led us to the point where we're at the World Cup in Qatar. But um, presumably they're the uh, adopted home team at this point. Yeah, um, there's Moroccans everywhere in the world. Morocco, the, the, the parallels to Irish football in the early 90s are, are enormous, except they have 40 million people and they have about 10 million expats. I'm talking first generation expats around the world. So they're in the Middle East, in the entire region. I couldn't believe it after the Spain game when I was walking through this, the souk on kind the of way home. I got off early. I got off the, the metro early just to walk through it all. And it was it was Moroccan families so like they're from the region. They were driving home the next morning. You know, they came and did a like they, it wasn't uh, people. Obviously, thousands have come from Morocco, but all over the Middle East is Moroccans of all different classes and uh, educated, uneducated all over here working because they can slip and slide into it. And it, it's evident throughout the world that the support for them is enormous. I think the only Arab country or only African country that hasn't really got in behind them is Algeria, the neighbors. But like. Just try and imagine in like 1990, no, 94, imagine in 94 if Ireland had a team that was not at the end of its kind of cycle, that wasn't a bunch of old guys, that was at their absolute peak um, and were in America. What, just imagine how the support would generate to be Irish Americans coming out, they were coming out of all angles, you know. Imagine we got to a, that semi over there. That's what's happening now. And it's the support is everyone is behind them. The Qataris, you, see, you can see the Qataris at games because they're all they're in all white and they come in late to every match. And you can see them because they don't celebrate, they don't move. And there's patches of white in all the red around all these stadiums, which are being very badly run. It's really hard to get into stadiums. It's like it was half empty 20 minutes, 20 minutes into the game, the quarterfinal. It was just disgraceful stuff. But you can see the, the, the local Qataris because the Moroccans are just bouncing. I mean, I'm talking like children, uh, grown men, grannies. They're all just up and down, singing, dancing. And the Qataris are just sitting there, like as is their tradition, not to show too much emotion in public. And so you can see all of that, but they're there. They're coming out in massive numbers where they haven't come out in massive numbers since Qatar's like nightmare opening match. But they're they were fa- they're fascinated with Argentina. They're fascinated with Brazil, and they're really really taken. Like the Arab world is completely locked into this. I know a lot of Moroccans around the world and who have no interest in football, and they're really tuned in now. It's it's pretty special stuff. It is uh, getting mentioned everywhere that like their achievement, <clears throat> obviously first African team, first Arab team. Like it's coming up in the NFL commentaries last night where, oh, what about yeah. that story about Morocco? It's kind of, it is this kind of 
uh, crossover that's pulling the whole world in. Um, so, like at this stage, we obviously hope that they manage to continue with the level of performance. But like, there's no sign of them falling over. Yeah, the only thing I will note though is the team are falling apart a little bit. Um, the West Ham centre back he's injured, Naid uh, Aguerd, um, who's been injured a lot for West Ham. So you haven't seen him. He's absolutely world class. And the captain, the other centre back, Roman Sice, he got carried off now with a torn hamstring. So the kind of the, now Amrabat is the heart of the team. Um, I was actually sitting watching. We watched it again last night, and I was sitting beside Kev Kilban, and he was like. There was just moments in the play. He was like, forget about the game. Just watch him now. He just plugs holes. It's very Roy Keenish, And I think Liverpool are looking at him to sign him. He just, and I know the manager um, went last summer, he went for a random weekend over to, over to Florence, went and spent some time in the Fiorentina training camp to tell him that he's a Champions League midfielder, to tell him if he does a couple of A, B and C, he'll be either in the Premier League or at a Barcelona or at something in the next couple of months. And he'll be the absolute gel. He'll be the absolute key man in the Moroccan team. And he said all of this after the Croatia game and he's just gotten better and better and better. He's probably in the media, the the post-match and the pre-match Moroccan media is brilliant. If you can link into it or see it or get it, it's 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 unbelievable stuff because uh, the coach is brilliant. He's so clever and so smart. But also the fact that the journalists do, they, they kind of lose the run of themselves a little bit where some of them are getting up going, I have no question. I just want to tell you that you are, I love you and uh, we, the whole country is behind you. And there's a lot of this like uh, crying as, as they ask a question at the end. They go, is there, so they, they give a big speech and they go, is there any injury updates or anything else going on? But it's, um, yeah, everything, everything around them is, the same as Argentina now, everything around them is a massive event because their people are here. Their people are here in the tens of thousands and how we have France, Morocco. Well, the most interesting thing is Hakimi against Mbappé, two best friends, two Paris Saint-Germain players, which also means the Qataris have skidded the game, so they're fascinated by it. But al Stadium is out in the middle of the desert. Um, it's going to be really difficult to get. A lot of Moroccans are trying to come to games and just kind of get in without tickets. They've been accused of it. I think a lot of them are coming with tickets and they're coming in such vast numbers. There's no metro out there. It's already been a major problem at the Al Tumna Stadium outside. There was a couple of near, near really scary moments about near crushes. And I'd be really worried about the France. There won't be that many French people here. There's not that many European, except for the English, who are now gone. Um, but the Albaid Stadium is extremely difficult to get to. Um, they have no experience of how to run major tournaments. And it could be a really worry for how they can act. Because there's, there's, there is tens and tens of thousands of Moroccans who are trying to get tickets on the black market, even though the prices are off the charts. But getting to that stadium is going to be a real test of how this tournament's legacy it will be remembered. We've been seeing images, Gavin, like I saw on the TV at half time, I think, of the match, like fans being shown, <clears throat> excuse me, coming in like, you know, 20, 25 minutes into the match. Now, thankfully, they, they managed to get in in time to see the Moroccan goal, but that just is fairly bonkers that that can happen at a World Cup. My interpretation of it is, and from talking to people before the, st- the match and outside and afterwards, and Moroccans and Moroccan families and um, who came, is there was a there's such a fear here that they don't have a repeat of the Wembley or the Stade de France experience for the Euros final or the Champions League final. That when they and a lot of the police are, are not from here; they've, they've been brought in and they've been trained. Like all the staffs and all the people here, they've been trained within an inch of their lives about how to do things. So caution is comes first. So when there's a swell of a crowd. They've closed the gates and they've stopped people and then they've tried to trickle them in because they, they, they literally just don't know how to run uh, World Cups because it's an extremely difficult thing to do. And if you don't have experience of massive major events in your country, like Dublin would never ha- be able to do this with eight stadiums. We, could, we can barely do Crow Park and the Aviva Stadium on the same day. I think, I think it's only happened a couple of times and it's not a good idea, you know. So when they when they come in, they stop them, and they so the people are getting really desperate there. Like a mo- you can't get an Uber anywhere near. There was no metro to the to the stadium that Morocco played most of their games in, so you have to walk eight kilometers south from the city. I really wish I was talking about football here, by the way. But you're sitting in at a World Cup quarterfinal, going, "Where is the other twenty thousand people?" Knowing that there's a hundred thousand Moroccans up the road, you know, and uh, even still, the the atmosphere of uh, Moroccan and Argentinian games is something is just incredible. It's something that'll stay with me to the end of my days. I never thought I could see bigger than some of the experiences I've had in Crow Park and other Ireland football matches over the years. But what I've seen with the Argentinian fans in Lusail and Moroccans just everywhere in the city is it's really made it saved the World Cup. It's made it. It's kind of overshadowed all the shameful stuff that's been done by FIFA and the Supreme Committee. It's um, 
it also it means that you're you know you're at the you're you're at the, the, the a World Cup. You know what I mean? You really do feel like it's the, the games are it's unbelievably brilliant. But um, yeah, and there's there's a whole Irish story element when you look at the Moroccans. If you're here, you just see the, the granular thing and what what the FAI could have done in the '90s and what we didn't do. Like the way the Moroccans have gone in and scouted in Europe, second, third generation players. Zidic is a great one. Like he's uh, there, he's their Zidane. He's the Zidane that Algeria should have had, if you know what I mean. Um, like he was Dutch. He got into Dutch squad when he was about 22, 23. And then somebody, a scout or an agent or somebody from Morocco got to him and said, you've grown up in Holland your entire life, but they've always treated you like a Moroccan. So why would you let the Dutch now treat you like a Dutch player? Because you're about to sign for Ajax. And so he flipped and became and went to Morocco. And Van Basten was his one of his early coaches. Said he was stupid, and he turned around. His quote in response to Van Basten was, "Yes, uh, Michael Van Basten was a great player, but not a very good manager." <laughs> I mean, it is an incredible story, and I think uh, they're definitely winning friends and influencing people for sure. Um, we should talk about the the Argentina game. Um, yeah, like the whole thing is. Uh, I mean, it's a. It, there will be documentaries made about the game itself, like the. Um, we, we talk about the football in a moment, but this is the game that Grant Wall falls ill at. Yeah. Um, I don't think we we all kind of came together, a lot of English and Irish journalists and a bunch of Canadians were there last night. We kind of came together to decompress the whole experience because um, like it's something, for, I have to say that it is for two reasons. It's 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 an occasion and an event in that massive World Cup final stadium in the brand new city in Lusail. Argentina, Netherlands is something that none of us will ever forget simply because Grant, died in front of a good few uh, Irish reporters' eyes. I was a couple of rows down, um, and the whole exp- the whole the traumatic experience of what was happening as the penalty shootout was starting. So that meant all of us were on, like, in this, and, like, poor us, but, like, we were in this incredible, torturous period of rewrites because you'd written everything. We, and, like, for example, the Irish Times was ho- literally holding the Saturday newspaper for me to file my front page of the sports, 900 words, and I'd written... This brilliant 900 words about Messi's uh, assist and, and the whole process of creating that goal and everything. And that was all gone out the window when Weggers came on. I was saying his name now, he's the Burnley Basictus uh, striker, but the seven foot tall guy comes on and scores two goals and did a goal in the 99th minute of injury time to send us into extra time, which just meant everyone was rewriting. Like there was a, you've heard all this before, there was a collective groan across the whole press box when it went 2-2 and then a massive fight broke out, which I don't think you've seen on TV. Massive fight broke out between the Dutch and the uh, Argentinian players after the game. Not the one uh, that was started by kicking into the dugout, another one. So we were watching this and trying to rewrite, tearing up your pieces. And then the grand stuff happened just at the end of extra time where he took ill and there was a 20 minute period of, res- of attempted resuscitation for him. And uh, yeah, it was um, it was incredibly difficult to um, retain focus because you, you you literally had no choice because again, as I said, the newspaper was waiting for my copy. But there was people coming down who were moved down the seats who were sitting beside me who were in a terrible and awful state because of what they'd just witnessed. And then we we just had to we just had to keep working and get on with it. And I remember being at the press conference after. There was a couple of people who I know who were a bit shook. And uh, uh, me and another guy, we just left. We didn't wait for Messi. <laughs> Imagine like being at a World Cup quarter final and going. It doesn't really matter, you know. Uh, we just went and got the train home. And then the, the flip side of that is you're on this, you're on the metro back into Doha and there's thousands of Argentinians who are just deliriously happy, who have no knowledge about Grant, Grant Wall and he's a brilliant American soccer journalist. And I actually, I, I was actually going to say to him, I didn't want to be kind of fanboy, but I'd seen him a good few times in the press box. I don't know him, a lot of the other lads did. But I remember that in 2002, he wrote the, the chosen one, the LeBron piece for Sports Illustrated. That was the sem- when LeBron James was 17 years old and uh, they got to him. They knew he was going to be, like they were already saying he's going to be better than Kobe Bryant. He could be the next Michael Jordan. And Grant was the guy who did the first big interview. And they put a 17-year-old high school kid who hadn't even been got into the draft yet on the cover of Sports Illustrated. And that was Grant. That was one of Grant Wall's great, great pieces of work. And it's from 20 years ago. So, um, yeah, it was that whole that whole thing and it's um I, my, my thoughts go out like to his family and a lot of his friends who were here and a lot of people who work with him who um football probably one of the greatest games of football you'll ever get, see or i don't know what, what your reception was or what you saw at home but it was one of the most in, 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 insane beautiful events that i've ever been at and um for a lot of people it's uh, only going to be remembered for one thing unfortunately yeah for sure um in, incredible difficult circumstances and as you say condolences to his family it's just a horrific situation for them and um you know hopefully 
uh, they find some peace. Um, the, the football, obviously, I mean, uh, it being football continues. Um, has there been fallout from the rouse and Emmy Martinez basically saying this whole thing is corrupt? Like uh, his post-match interview is one of the most remarkable winning interviews I've ever seen from anybody in any sport ever where the interviewer keeps prompting him to go, yeah, but you just, it, it was great. And he's like, yeah, but the referee, what was that all about? <laughs> so, um, is there a potential balance yeah. or do they want to just like not ban anybody because it's a World Cup semi-final? What happens? Referee lost control. I think that was, I hope, I presume that was apparent on the TV. He also lost, the, the Brazilian referee in England, France completely lost control. It was, it looked completely out of his depth. Um, the uh, I, I you know the, the now famous picture of uh, the, the Argentinian lads going right up into Dutch faces as they run towards uh, uh, the goal after winning. There's a backstory to that picture that needs to be told. Yeah, they well totally deserved because, it. <laughs> yeah, no, like Messi said it afterwards. Like, have you ever seen Messi as angry as he was afterwards? He went that thing where he puts his hands up to his ears. That was because of Louis Van Gaal uh, treated Riquelme terribly in the one year he was at Barcelona. And didn't want him, and so that was Raquel May's celebration. So he was going doing that to Louis Van Gaal. There was like how Virgil Van Dijk didn't get sent off for that body check again. I presume you saw that. Um, that was in play. He didn't even get booked. Um, there was a lot of stuff, but the, the Dutch had been completely needling the Argentinians, and like the Argentinians obviously don't need an excuse, you know. And once they won the penalty shootout, yeah, they stuck it to them. But it looks. There's a perception out there, and it's all over social media, that the Argentinians are a disgrace and they're, they're bad sportsmen and all that. Everyone was at it. It was uh, it was chaos. And the referees are not allowed to show red cards. I'm, I don't know with certainty, obviously, but my opinion is that the referees are just not allowed to show red cards at this tournament. And so it, it should have been... There should have been... It, it could have been controlled and calmed down by a couple of cards. Also, Messi's blessed that he didn't get a second yellow, um, which would have been a nightmare. So there's something in that. But... Uh, I think it being FIFA and it being a World Cup semi-final, I think they'll just creep past us and let's just get to the semis. And again, no, no, you no red cards in the semis. Let's just get in, get ourselves into the final. A lot of people, I'd say, who work in FIFA just want to get the hell out of here as well because um, it's the best football tournament. It's probably the best World Cup ever. It's certainly the best World Cup I can ever remember. 86, I was only a kid, so but 86 had such an impact on a lot of people my age, and I presume you as well, Jared. But uh, this is just, it's been phenomenal. But, off the pitch, if you get off the beaten track and you, do, you don't stick on the meet to FIFA buses and you don't go out to their their big media center that has beautiful food and beautiful, it's, do you know what the media center is like here? It's in the big Qatar National Library. It's like as if Google took over all the media houses in Ireland, and it, it's like a, it's basically like one big giant Google office where you could sleep there, you can do your laundry there. There's a medical center, there's everything. But if you leave that and get a few Ubers, talk to the Ubers, which are very cheap, obviously, for, because of the petrol. Uh, and if you walk to stadiums, if you go to the worker estates where they live, I'm, I'm writing a piece that's probably going to be published the Monday after the tournament, just about everything else I've seen outside of the tournament. And it's it's vast. And uh, for all the magnificence we're watching and the brilliance, and there's so many things we haven't even talked about here, uh, like the Argentinian fans just going to war with the FIFA, the blaring of the music and these fake bands at halftime and everything. the Argentinian fans who are here in their droves and they found ways of affording it and they, they've taken over a little town which I have to go down and see. It's kind of like, looks like the old Ballymun Flats and they're all in there and they're in there every day partying. It's, it's an all workers village. So there's, some, there's just so many other things happening off the pitch and the treatment of hotel staff, the treatment of FIFA workers who might get a day off working 10, 12 hour days made stand up no breaks for so much hotel stuff. Like we think we're working hard and then you look at them and like we get to go home, we're well paid, we get to go home for Christmas, we're going to get breaks after this. They just go pour into another job. Like it's the, the cruelty. Miguel Delaney wrote a piece in the Independent, the London Independent, which I sent people towards where he compared it to what it must have been like for Europeans visiting the deep south of America in the 1860s. And he's not exaggerating. Um, it's, it's, it's horrific some of the things you see. Like if you don't have a plan, if you work here, you live here. You can make good money. You don't pay income tax. You can. It, it's a gateway. There is a huge thing. It's a gateway to get a visa if you're African to America to another place. But um, if you don't have a plan when you get here, or if you come here as a, in a refugee status, I met an Afghanistani taxi man last night. There's no way out. There's no escape. Um, and it's like uh, because it, it's so strange the mood because you're, you're the joy of all the football we're experiencing. But then on the days off, you see the grimness of Doha and the treatment of people. They're not even called humans, they're called workers all the time. And it's it's stuff that uh, it'll stay with me forever, unfortunately. I look forward to reading that piece. Um, hopefully you'll be home by the time it's published. 
<laughs> yeah, I think I'm home. I think I fly out like at like 2 a.m. after the World Cup final, so um, we'll see. Listen, great stuff, Gav. Stay safe. Thanks for joining us. Cheers. Take Gavin Cummins, keep the Irish Times there.